Welcome everyone to this hour that we have together to discuss one of the most pressing issues of our time. How can we help the young people around us to gain more resilience and a stronger mental health? My name is Karin Brocki. I am a professor of psychology at Uppsala University and my research focuses around uh, the psychological processes behind mental health in children and adolescents. And as of late, I have also studied uh, the impact of the pandemic on mental health in Sweden. Last October, I had the privilege to lead the program committee for the Uppsala Health Summit on Pathways to Lifelong Mental Wellbeing. The summit, which was attended by participants from over 70 countries, resulted in an impressive collection of knowledge and policy recommendations that are compiled in, in a compendium of briefs, which we trust is a useful reference in your work to promote and protect mental health for all ages everywhere. This brief can also be downloaded from the Uppsala Health Summit webpage. Today we have the opportunity to discuss some of the findings of this report and we will focus especially on young people who are at a particular vulnerable place, especially after the pandemic and now in relation to the new global crisis that we are facing. Our thoughts are with the Ukrainian people. Today is also International Women's Day and a great opportunity to recognize the gender disparity in mental ill health, with women being twice as likely as men to suffer from a mental illness. There's a clear need for more research in this area to, be, to develop prevention and treatment methods that are specific to women. Before starting today's discussion, I will summarize the main point, points of the post-conference report. First, how do we best fight the stigma that is still associated with mental ill health and mental disorders across the world, exacerbating the burden of those who suffer? Here, a global perspective change on mental health is key. We need to spread the world, word on what mental health really is, that it exists on a dimension ranging from good mental health, symptoms of mental distress that we all experience as a natural part of life, to mental disorders. And importantly, there are quantitative rather than qualitative differences in the mental processes behind these mental conditions. But most importantly, mental ill health can affect everyone. In some ways, the COVID-19 pandemic has helped us realize this fact through its negative impacts on mental health across the world. Concrete recommendations from the workshops included increased public education on this topic, preferably from an early age and as part of the school curriculum. Increased knowledge and awareness is perhaps particularly important in developing countries where the significance of mental health is often less appreciated and prioritized. But we can all help starting today with spreading the word that mental ill health can affect everyone and is as such everyone's business. A second important point of discussion in several of the workshops was how we can use concrete and scalable ways of protecting and promoting global mental health and what the most promising targets in reaching these goals really are. Here, primary intervention or stopping mental health before um, they start was particularly emphasized, especially in the talk by Vikram Patel, professor of global health at Harvard University. In other words, early life prevention is key. This developmental perspective is based on the, on the fact that adversities early in life is robustly associated with mental ill health and physical ill health across the lifespan. We need to act early, especially in adverse environments uh, in which children are at increased risk for developing mental distress. Concrete recommendations for early inter intervention included scale scaling up parenting interventions, teaching children life skills in schools, such as strategies for emotion regulation and problem solving skills, easy access to low intensity mental health care, and provide less stressful environments in schools to preserve children's self-confidence and self-efficacy, known to be resilience factors against mental ill health. Third, rather than reinventing the wheel, we need to ask how we can make evidence-based psychological treatments more readily available 
using innovative methods. Here, reorganizing service delivery models is necessary. New psychological approaches based on low intensity therapy delivered through step care models, including various self-help techniques delivered through the internet and smartphone apps was brought up as, as important. Another sex successful evidence-based and concrete method that we can learn from is the friendship bench from Zimbabwe, where grandmothers are trained to deliver CBT-based therapy on wooden benches across the community. It has shown to increase quality of life in both the patients and in the grandmothers delivering uh, this therapy. It is evidence-based, very accessible and scalable. Let this method inspire us. Physical activity is an evidence-based method known to have beneficial effects on our mental health. Here, the Swedish method of physical activity on prescription was brought up in one of the workshops. It is also a good example of a highly accessible self-help method that we can implement ourselves as we see fit. Fourth, clearly Uppsala Health Summit 2021 resulted in many innovative ideas and recommendations for protecting and promoting global mental health and well-being. The summit is a small but important step towards increased awareness and joint action across societal levels and countries. We are all part of the problem as well as the solution. Now, over to Fredrik Lindenkrona, who will moderate today's session. Fredrik is the lead for strategic improvement and international collaborations. Swedish Association of Local Authorities and Regions. With that said, I leave the floor to you, Frederick. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karin, and thank you so much, Uppsala Health Summit for 2021. It's an excellent achievement uh, for the team, and it's an excellent uh, from you leading this as the chair of the program committee. Wonderful work. Thank you. And all of you around the globe who will watch this and have watched it, um, we're really here together. Um, I think what the conclusions uh, refer to me, they are really also in line with many other statements made during the last couple of years, where the establishment of mental health and well-being as a critical societal challenge to really build on together is represented by the WHO definition uh, where mental health and well-being is critical to our lives and how we live them, as well as our communities. Uh, it's also critically part of the Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development and the five Ps of people, planet, prosperity, partnership, and not to uh, mention the least, peace as critical to our thriving together. It's also part of what's been developed within the OECD over the last couple of years, where uh, some of the more interesting policy recommendations are really the ones intertwining mental health, education, labor market, and other sectors. And I think that's the way to go. And that's really what signals through to me in what's said in the recommendations and the conclusions that Karin has so beautifully referred to. With me to discuss this, um, I think that the critical um, piece here is to represent the width of the competencies in the panel. So let me first uh, let the panel say uh, welcome uh, and I'll be happy to first welcome Prudence. Uh, can you just say a few words about um, who you um, welcome Prudence? Thank you so very much and it's an honor for me to be part of this Uppsala Health Summit panel. My name is Prudence Atukunda and I'm working with ACT Alliance Church of Sweden as a senior thematic advisor, community-based psychosocial support in humanitarian setting. Much of my work and experience in research has been in low and middle income countries where we've had several mental health interventions that include community-based as well as nutritional psychiatry in low and middle income countries. So I'm looking forward to be part of this discussion with emphasis on what interventions can be implemented in the low and middle income countries. So a pleasure to have you all and I look towards having a successful and a very interesting discussion on this passionate topic I'm going to be part of. Thank you. You're so welcome, Prudence. It's an honor to have you on board. Lance. Hi everyone, I'm Lance McCracken. 
I'm a professor in clinical psychology in the psychology department uh, here in Uppsala. I'm very happy to be here. I can't wait to hear what other people will say. And uh, yeah, let's get started. Fantastic. Um, and David. Hi, Frederick. Um, I'm David Anthony. I'm the chief of strategic planning, convening and emerging research areas at UNICEF Office of Research in the Chenti here in Florence. And we've started the last two years a strong strand of work on mental health, including looking at how the COVID pandemic is really affecting young people across the world in high, low and middle income countries. So happy to be here today to share that with you. Over. And, and Jacqueline Sperling. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. I'm looking forward to learning from all of you and discussing these really important topics. So I am a clinical psychologist and faculty at Harvard Medical School, as well as a co-program director of the McLean Anxiety Mastery Program at McLean Hospital. It's an intensive outpatient group-based program for children and adolescents with anxiety and or OCD and comorbid diagnoses. Um, also very passionate about disseminating information, evidence-based tools of the community, so I write blog posts for parents, part of Harvard Health Publishing, and also try to speak out into the community as much as possible. So I um, really appreciate being a part of a community here that's also passionate about supporting youth. Amazing. Thank you uh, for being with us. Uh, and thank you more than 80 people in this conversation at the moment, uh, breadth uh, across the globe spanning. And I think one of the most important lessons that we've learned in the development of this field is that every country when it comes to mental health and well-being is a developing country. I think that saying is really important because it also helps us in sort of the high income countries to be much more um, looking outside of our own borders. I think there is uh, having the privilege to work a lot internationally. I often see extremely interesting examples in areas uh, where uh, less resources may be available. Uh, and there's also a lot of new innovations happening, which is really happening in settings that you wouldn't necessarily think of in terms of uh, uh, places, spaces and so on, where people live their lives. I think that the overarching conclusion I'm drawing from this is in, in line with what many others have said, is that we have to do this work earlier in more of the everyday environments. And also it has to become, as Karin was so well articulating, everyone's business. So those are some of the things we, we think we need to, to sort of start uh, drawing on. What are the ways to make those things happen more than they already do? So I'll let you all in the round, starting with um, David, have a few of the reflections of one, some of the conclusions and inputs that uh, Karin was giving from the summit. What are some of your thoughts of, of, of uh, what you heard? Yeah, thanks, Frederick. I think that in many ways, a lot of the symptoms that we're seeing in mental health among young people kind of predate the COVID crisis, you know, uh, even before then, we were looking at maybe one in seven young people having some diagnosed condition um, as a mental disorder. And that's a WHO type of estimate. Um, and a lot of these things were developed in the very early childhood. We were seeing very much that half of these mental disorders come before the age of 10 and three quarters before the age of 17, 18. So it's uh, something that we really need to take into account um, as a childhood issue. Um, but what we've seen with COVID is that COVID has kind of exacerbated this picture. And even though we haven't got full data in from some of our own research, what we've been seeing is uh, those children with pre-existing mental disorders, um, they really have suffered the most. Uh, we've seen girls suffer more than boys, particularly in terms of anxiety and depression, boys more on substance abuse. Uh, we've seen those who are in lower social economic status suffer more than others. Those in areas really affected by COVID uh, suffer a lot. Um, and really the perception, I think, among children of, uh, of a depressive state, not just um, 
COVID, but COVID combined with climate change, combined with increasing inequality, and then combined with the specter of a conflict and war, um, has led to really maybe a mental health crisis among the youth that as COVID somewhat subsides in certain countries, we now have to get to grips with. Uh, Prudence, what are some of your reflections on uh, the summit's conclusions and things you might want to stress or add to that? Yeah, in addition to what uh, David has said, I have to say I have uh, four key areas of the conclusions that are of really great interest to me. One, it is the urgent need of investment in young people's mental health across all sectors. And that applies in both uh, the high income countries as well as low and middle income countries. So that to me, it is an urgent need and a priority for the national budgets, for the economic social support to invest a lot of uh, funding in this field, specifically for the young and uh, adolescents. Secondly, scaling up evidence-based interventions that are really culturally appropriate, that are designed in a context that they can be applied to, for instance, the reference to the, 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 the interventions that are happening in different areas post-COVID in various countries, which are contextualized, not rather than developed outside the situation or the culture where they're going to be applied. And also, thirdly, uh, breaking the silence on mental health when it comes to young people, we really need, it's time to take it up and we break this silence because we see that post COVID, it is a highly uh, increased the vulnerability among specifically the young people. It is as a result of the breakdown of the social determinants of mental health that we saw during the COVID in the process of trying to make restrictions to show that, to, to prevent. Uh, the further spreading of COVID, schools were, were closed and that affected the children. So that is an urgent need also to break the silence on mental health and really show that we need to take it up, especially in this category of people. And also making sure that we emphasize that mental health is part of the physical health. It can no longer continue being viewed as otherwise. It should be integrated across all the sectors and given priority like any other other our uh, health uh, interventions as well as funding. That is from me. Thank you. So you also being actively uh, you know, in the clinical space here, um, what's some of your reflections and what can you add to what's already been said by David and Prudence? Sorry, who did you? Who did, did you? you say Lance, Lance. Sorry, I was. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll begin then. <laughs> And then hand over. I, I like what uh, David and uh, Prudence have just said, um, I, and I agree with it. Uh, one thing I one thing I'd say is that um, a focus on mental health is uh, to have a, the term mental health and to uh, 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 to be able to advertise the need to address mental mental health. I think works to a certain extent. The trouble for me has always been that as soon as you call something mental health and you make it a distinct part of health that, and you have a physical health and a mental health, you also create a division. When you say mental, the ear hears a difference. And I, I, I think to a certain extent, this is unhelpful. One thing it does is it kind of puts the problem inside the person and not in the world around them. And it, it, uh, it makes that division where they're where perhaps it would be better if there weren't a division. I think all of it is health. Um, there's something about mental health that I think is a bit disempowering. It's a bit stigmatizing and it's, it makes a distinction and it can't, it, 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 uh, it's hard to create perfect equity once you have two different words. So this is, I, I don't know a solution to this, but I, I, I think uh, maybe if we, began to call it personal health or something else, it, it could be a better way um, to do this. So this is, this is one of my things. The other, the other um, point that keep, keeps coming up for me is that while we talk about how will we build resilience, we mustn't forget the other question. How will we build a better world? How will we, how will we address the conflict, inequity, uh, effects of disinformation, the degradation of the environment. How will we apply solutions to these problems, make the world a better place? 
so that the uh, the pressure isn't entirely on helping people to adjust to the difficulties that we, to a certain extent, find ways to, with science, hopefully, to turn down some of these difficulties. Thank you, Lance. And uh, Jacqueline, what's your reflections on the wider things that have been said from Karin and the rest of the panel? Well, sure. So I echo what everyone else so thoughtfully said. Um, and just to offer something in addition, I would say something that I think is really powerful is incorporating, um, well, to build upon what Lance said, is also health curriculum in general in school. It should be a core part of the curriculum. And I think that also would um, circumnavigate a lot of the current issues that we have right now. So, like, for example, those with social anxiety, it only 5% seek treatment within the first year of experiencing symptoms. And what's more is that if more than a third wait 10 years before receiving help. And it's a lot of time that there may be a lack of awareness or like what is even available or, like, or minimizing their own experiencing or thinking it's something that's wrong with them versus that there's something that there's knows that they can actually treat and work on. And in addition to that, I think that Children need to learn how to maintain their health. Just as they learn to brush their teeth and what foods are healthy to nourish their body, they need to learn tools to keep their emotions in check. That's part of their everyday routine and to be more proactive versus reactive. And so if it's incorporated as part of the school curriculum, just as math and language and science are, then they're learning that it's just as important and that they need to keep up those activities. Uh, schools or many schools, at least in the states that require physical education, and then there's a brief health class that you have to take, which, by the way, says nothing about mental illness and so or mental health. And so I think we really need to make it a core part of the curriculum and learn tools to manage it. Excellent. And what I'm hearing from you are a couple of reflections I'm making. One is clearly on the fact that there's at least two kinds of integrations we need to do. One is to integrate mental health within the wider health concept. And possibly the other one might also be to find a way to articulate what this is and how it can be expressed within the philosophy or per principles in many other societal sectors and topics. So what's the way to think about this for climate change? What is the way to think about this, these capabilities for people within schooling? So uh, I think those two elements of integration are really critical to, to, because we, it's really clear that these things are underpinning the opportunities to, to do any kind of societal transformation, I would argue, uh, at scale. Uh, and think about these different levels from you know, inner uh, elements uh, and our relationships and our relationships to others and the, yeah, the neighborhood perspective and so on. So at those different scales also, I think, is something we have to be finding new approaches to think about because uh, um, there are certainly issues around kids and, and youth at the moment that are truly distressing. And uh, how do we find a way both to build uh, capability coping, etc., but also understand how we can uh, develop agency collectively to maybe start to work against those. So um, with that, we come back to this discussion after a little bit of an in-depth um, reflection that Jackie has um, offered to provide us, which is excellent. We really thank her for that. So uh, we'll go for, um, for you, um, Jackie, and some of the yeah, reflections you want to make from your experience in working with young people. Jack Jackie. Sure. Sure, thank you so much. Is it okay time to share the slides? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, and before I forget, begin, I also want to take a moment to acknowledge what's going on in Ukraine and um, absolutely condemn the atrocities that are happening there. And also for all, of you, for all of you who are connected to anyone there, I hope that they are getting out safely. Um, and I so appreciate all of you being here because children need support more than ever. Um, also before I begin, just disclosures is that I recently published a book through the American Psychological Association's Imagination Press called Find Your Fears, How to Put Social Anxiety in Its Place for Young Adults with Social Anxiety. Okay, so what are we going to cover today? Where are we now? What are some potential reasons why? What are the barriers to moving forward? And 
it's not all dark, there's hope. What are some ideas for how to address the current needs? Okay, so where are we now? So research was conducted, polling studies from that were conducted during the first year of the pandemic. And so in totals, over 80,000 youth would participate in these 29 studies the first year of the pandemic. And what they found is one in four youth had clinically elevated levels of depression. One in five had clinically elevated levels of anxiety. That's double pre-pandemic rates. We have another pandemic on our hands and it's a mental illness pandemic that absolutely needs to be addressed. So what are some potential reasons why that the rates have doubled? So social isolation, particularly in the first year of the pandemic, teens whose peers become increasingly important, they were disconnected from their peers under to protect their physical health, their, and that they were no longer able to connect with them in person. And being socially isolated can increase mental health distress. And also for those who are experiencing anxiety, the lockdowns colluded with the anxiety by reinforcing anxiety through avoidance. So not going to school, not separating from your caregivers, not having to participate in front of other people, interact with other people, really reinforce anxiety. And in addition to that, People also had a lack of opportunities to practice social skills and they're not going to school every day and they're at home and then just in front of a screen on mute on Zoom. They're not able to have those natural interactions. And a lot of children endorse feeling kind of like rusty with their social skills and all of a sudden they had to go back to school pretty abruptly and then feeling like I haven't really interacted with a whole bunch of people in a while and not feeling like they were equipped to make that transition. And also, many youth missed many milestones and experiences, graduation, sports tournaments, birthday parties, those who transitioned to college their freshman year remotely. You can't get that back. And so that also negatively impacts one's mental health. And in addition, that by the very nature of having remote schooling, that youth spent more time being sedentary and on screens, and then research has shown that those who spent more time on screens um, actually and endures higher rates of mental health distress. So let's talk about some other reasons why. Many youth also lost a family member, a teacher, or adult, other adult figure, and is potentially a traumatic loss if they witnessed the illness, hospitalizations were needed, and there also could have been hypervigilance due to threat of their own illness. And if even if they weren't worried about getting sick, um, they could have been worried about family members who are at risk with compromised immune systems. So being constantly on edge and worrying and not for a short period of time. In addition, there would be stress caused by parental job loss or financial changes. So many families experience hardship in the pandemic. And there also have been racial disparities in COVID's impact. So for those racial disparities, particularly in the States, there were higher rates of COVID for racial minorities and experiencing more negative impact from the pandemic. And then more broadly, social injustice, socio-political climate has been um, um, quite active in terms of all the different examples of social injustice and we are, living them right now, and that children are being exposed to those and then those can negatively impact their mental health. All right, so let's talk about some of the barriers now that we've talked about things that might be um, increasing mental health distress. What are some of the barriers moving forward? And again, it's not all dark. We will get to the ideas for hope for moving forward. But access to care has not increased at the rate of mental illness. So just mental illness rates doubled. It's not that the number of clinicians have has increased. Um, there's also a lack of insurance coverage for evidence-based treatment. Many of those who, who are trained to do evidence-based treatment, they offer self-pay services um, and hospitals don't get re reimbursement rates, so they're less likely to offer insurance coverage for their child outpatient care. And some programs, even when they are available, are not accessible via public transportation or they require costly parking fees. Parking structures at hospitals also often can be quite costly. In addition, so it was many people touted virtual care as increasing access to um, mental health care. Um, however, 
Virtual care requires access to computers and Wi-Fi, and not all families have access to those resources. And in addition, program documents and treatment often are not translated into families' um, language that they speak fluently. And in addition to that, there's often a lack of trust in healthcare, rightly so, that there have been negative experiences with the healthcare system. There have been some populations where they were involuntarily recruited for uh, research studies, or they may not have been provided um, equitable care. And so they don't trust the healthcare system. They may not be seeking treatment when they need it. So, what can we do to move forward? Definitely at the policy level, make changes for insurance coverage, have better reimbursement rates, make this care more accessible. We need to train more graduate students and current clinicians. Not all current clinicians are trained in evidence-based treatments. And we need to make that training more accessible. A lot of times conferences, conferences can be quite costly. And so then that can be prohibitive for people to get training or to have to take time off from work, which also can be costly. And we need to make increase how culturally responsive treatments are. We need to make sure it's not a one size fits all. We need to do research to make sure that these evidence-based treatments are um, address a diverse population's needs, and then also make, you know, tailor different interventions to specific populations so that they feel like their needs are adequately met. In addition, so um, we talked about, talked about how virtual care, yes, can increase access in terms of reducing commuting um, means, but what about the access to laptops and Wi-Fi? And so one way that um, we have navigated it here is I've found that our public libraries offer laptops that families can check out for free. And then partnering with schools, they have Wi-Fi and seeing if there's a safe room that a child can use in the after school hours to participate in treatment with a library issued laptop. So find ways to make treatment more accessible. I may take some problem solving and thinking outside of the box. And when I mentioned that lack of trust in healthcare, you can increase, you can make treatment more available. However, we need to build trust through community partnerships to make people more likely to seek the treatment. We need to connect with them. We can't just go in there and being like, here's what we think what you need. We need to go in and we need to listen. We need to learn. We need to hear what their needs are, connect with those who have relationships with community members and learn from them and start to be able to build trust so that we can increase access to care. In addition, we need to provide translated documents, or if at least not going to have translated documents, we need to have interpreter services available so that families can access adequate care. Okay, so here's another example. So I'm not promoting the program which I work at all. It's just an example that, um, of a type of level of care that perhaps can be used in the community and address more of a need. So the program which I work, as I mentioned, it's an intensive outpatient group-based program. And doesn't necessarily have to be for kids with anxiety and or OCD, but it, using this as an example that they come to us or now virtually for multiple hours a day, for four days a week, for a minimum of several weeks. And it's group based and research has shown that group based treatment for anxiety is actually more effective than individual treatment. That group can be very powerful, but that group based treatment also makes us to be able to be able to treat more kids at, at one time and the fact that one month of our program is essentially about a year of outpatient treatment when you spread out the hours and so these kids ideally can get some momentum and get back to their daily routines more quickly and in turn create an opening for another child to receive care so what we found is based on child and parent reports comparing discharge to admission assessments, children and parents endorse reductions in children's anxiety symptoms, their functional impairment, meaning they're doing more of what they need to be doing, and their intolerance of uncertainty, which is a common underlying factor for anxiety, OCD, and depression. And the more that we can address common underlying factors, the more we can increase generalization and ideally prevent relapse down the road if they can generalize. And um, in addition, the treatment also addresses the family system. So there's a heavy caregiver involvement. And we found that not only did children report reductions in their depression, parents reported reductions in their distress levels. And lastly, you see a picture of a child on a computer and you also see community settings. So our program had been in person and we very regularly would do um, exposure and response prevention in the community. Now we're virtual. We have found that treatment has not significantly differed when 
operating remotely versus in person, um, despite the increase in acuity of children's symptoms. So the aim is also to be a hybrid program down the road, but it's just to show you that you can do multiple formats um, and address more of a need, hopefully. Okay, I know that's a lot of information. I just want to say thank you and hope everyone stays safe and healthy. I really thank you, Jacqueline. Amazing. What the world will tour uh, that really spans uh, widely from the clinical practice side towards a much more overarching. And those things, I think, to me, reflects the idea to integrate. We have to understand both the clinical side and the societal situation for those. And you also particularly strongly, I think, advocates for a culturally appropriate uh, social determinants, understanding clinical um, intervention uh, way to work with and developing together, I guess, with, um, with both those who we help to serve and the people working with them. So lovely. Thanks a lot. Um, now we're going to try to live up to what the whole summit has been. Pathways to lifelong mental well-being. Uh, it's a very interesting and important way to think around this uh, field, I would say. But let's be a little bit um, daring for the last uh, um, 25 minutes or so of this conversation. I really want us to start to have a little bit of a nugget of a feel of what are the things we have to be able to counter and what are the things we need to dream of having achieved in 2032. And to set us on that path, um, I've asked um, David to give us a bit of a, what's the situation right now? What are some of the trends that we have to take into consideration? Um, Please go ahead, David. Thanks, Frederick. Um, I'm going to not say very much. I think sometimes um, facts speak for themselves, as they say. So I've prepared a little presentation, which uh, I, I think you can play now. Let's have a little bit of a you know, pause because that's quite strong and quite heavy, David. Um, my suggestion now for all of you in the panel and others is to um, close your eyes for two seconds or maybe eight. So I'll do that myself. And when you're entering and opening your eyes, we're suddenly in 10 years ahead from now. The pathways to lifelong mental well-being might have been started to be built. Uh, people who are now um, 22 were 12 um, 10 years ago. So with that in mind, I think we should start to see some glimpses of, you know, how is the situation being able to cope with all these challenges that uh, that uh, David was, was putting up and also all the solutions that uh, and challenges that Jacqueline was putting up. So can I start with you, Lance? Get us a little bit of a snippet into what the world of 2032 looks like from uh, when we're applying our youth mental health and well-being lens. Would you want to start, please? Yeah, I don't mind. Thank you. Um, yeah, what comes to mind for me is that um, Solutions to the problems that we have now need um, some serious, deep cultural re-engineering. So I'd like to, in the future, I'd, 10 years from now or so, I would like to see us living in a culture 
where there's certain principles that we apply when we interact with our children. And one of them would be to help them to feel whatever they feel, whether it doesn't feel good or not. Uh, to help them to see that they're bigger than whatever story they have about who they are. The, whatever thoughts and feelings they have, they are bigger than those thoughts and feelings and don't need to be restrained by those thoughts and feelings. And to put an emphasis on taking action. Too often we make feeling good, or thinking positive, a preliminary step to actually engaging in what we want to do in life. And I think it would be better if we were more, if part of our culture was to say, well, let's just do it and see what happens. So that's my my three pe three principles for a re-engineering of our Fantastic. culture. Thanks a lot, Lance. And I head over to Prudence. What are some of your visions around 2032? Um, yeah, I came, I came with some picture. I don't know if it is visible to all of you. Yeah, you did. Yeah, so in 2032, this is how I viewed a family dinner and already it has started taking place whereby the family table is no longer as it used to be. It is highly changing due to technology, due to what is happening. And I'm um, seeing it not only as a negative impact, but something we can also utilize because we've got a lot of technological developments that we can use instead of furthermore making uh, health, mental health uh, a more vulnerable uh, subject, but we can use it to address mental health and it can also uh, be emphasized, especially for uh, the upcoming lower or middle income countries where a lot of cultural adaptations, cultural learnings are taking place with new technology that they, they, that they are also increasingly including. And we see it happening so far, like in Brazil, where they've uh, established uh, technological advancements with chat, online chats to be able to address symptoms of depression and also connecting them to uh, would be uh, interventions or health centers within the communities. So I'm seeing 2032 that despite the changes that are happening that are pretty fast and speedy when it comes to technology, we can use it for our generation to benefit their mental uh, well-being and general psychosocial well-being. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Prudence. Um, and I'm going over to um, uh, David. Thanks, nice, Frederick. I mean, what do I want to see in 2022? Well, I'm going to go back to 1982, actually, when Jim Grant, who was then head of UNICEF, launched a publication called The Progress of Nations. And his issue in The Progress of Nations that was there will come a time when nations measure their progress not on the wealth of their citizens or the military might that they have, but on the well-being of their children. If this does not become the central priority instead of GDP or how many weapons that you have, then it will be difficult. But increasingly, as countries, we know, as countries put children first and invest in children first, what tends to happen is their societies get more peaceful, get more prosperous, get more integrated. And when they put them last, we tend to have the opposite. They tend to be more conflictive, tend to be more impoverished, tend to be more unstable. So that's really what we have to look for, a holistic approach to make child well-being a central plank of how we measure a nation's progress. And that type of accountability needs to run throughout society. At the moment, it is just in the hands of the governments. Um, but the Convention on the Rights of the Child needs to become more of a living document for all citizens. And that health, as Prudence and others have said, needs to be seen as health. Lance, you made a good point about the idea of mental versus physical, and the mental stigmatizes just by the use of the word. We need to kind of change our lexicon as well around mental health. And we need to see that it is all health. But if we do talk about mental health, let's not just keep on having negative terms after the term mental health. 
if we are going to use it, let's use it in a much more neutral sense and be much more sensitive about our language as we are about other things such as gender and gender orientation, and sexual orientation nowadays. We've come a long way in that sense, but we've got a long way to go with mental health. Thank you. Thank you. And Jacqueline? Oh, so all fantastic points. Hard act to follow. Um, so I would say, you know, the image that comes to mind to me in terms of thinking about what is going to happen in 10 years from now is an open door with a hand reaching out and making care accessible. Um, and at the same time, I really think, and Bill Neum, David said, is like, it's really important to empower our youth and to give them access to all of these tools so they even know to go seek that help and that they can seek that help and that it's okay. Um, and so to really create this foundation in our education system and increase access to education based on what David is showing, so not everyone has that privilege and so that they can be equipped with that information and tools and that they actually can lead the change and create more change. And they they are our future and we really need to invest in them and we need to invest in their whole well-being, their health and as I said that their mental health is just as much as part of that as their physical health. I think that's sinking this as well. Um, what I'm hearing right now is a beautiful sort of macro, meso, micro kind of um, you know schedule of stuff we can do. Um, and, and putting that together to one of the things you said in the beginning, uh, we're talking about the central aspects of, of equity and understanding that my, people might need different kinds of ways of, of solving these kinds of issues, but also building their own resilience. Uh, uh, but also sectors might do. Uh, we have to think about what's the way to get um, different kinds of life settings to be able to take on what Lance so elegantly um, talked about, I think, in relation to you know, what kids need as, as parents and maybe other kids as well to be able to help them to develop and, and express and so on. So um, I'm thinking about that and I'm thinking about if we truly want to do what Corin was saying, that we really want to build this as something that goes on across um, all sectors and together between them. Um, one way was presented by David and the conversation that goes on right now, both around ch children's well-being and youth well-being and so on, being the really better way of measuring the progress of a society uh, and investing there. Uh, so what I'm sort of getting at here is, um, well, what are the steps that we can take to actually start moving even further? As you know, this is the end event of one part of a very long and continuous relay where the sprint has been done by Karin and team in Uppsala and with you all guys today. But then we have to find way, how do we keep this conversation really strongly going on? And what are some of the things that you will want to start doing right now as of tomorrow, March 9th or so, that will take us to um, that better situation taking the really distresses that was so clearly depicted in the trends shown by both um, Jacqueline and, and, and David. So what's the, and I think we really, really do need to express some ways to get forward because you can get quite distressed by viewing the slides that you showed, David. Uh, how do we really, you know, find our common uh, collaborative spirit to take? And what's the one thing you promise to start doing more of uh, to make this progress. Can I start with you, um, Lance? Yeah, oops, sorry. Um, yeah, I just would like to say that I, I really appreciate the, the comments that people have made. I, I mean, it's just really impressive, uh, um, just the, uh, how clever people are and, and what great ideas I'm hearing today. Um, I think I think a message for me that I, I hope that that I will intend to carry forward is I'm I'm a clinical psychologist so I always think of producing interventions for small scale and a clinical scale you know like a couple hundred people or something at the most or in a service you know a, a few hundred people a year but I I think we really need to scale up and I think personally I want to take that seriously um, I think we need to make Clinic, the, cl the principles and methods in our clinical solutions, we need to make them, produce them in a, in a form, a format 
that can be widely um, more widely available. So I, I, I think that's the that's the lesson for me from the summit and from our discussion today is I need to be a part of driving the research, uh, encouraging the PhD students, um, getting the data and, pr and producing the technology that people can access that is, is just more available. They can turn on their phone, they can get an app that's a really good app for really helping uh, in some of these ways that we're discussing today, to take one example. Very, very wonderful. Um, and Prudence, what, what's your, what do you want to contribute with uh, now uh, and over the coming years to bring this forward? Well, in total agreement with what Les is proposing, but also in addition to that, I will give an example of uh, what COVID has brought out now that has affected the whole world almost equally. It presents for us an opportunity to re-image mental health. And uh, this applies to both settings, as I had said previously, both in low and middle income countries, but also in high income countries. And it also presents a window of opportunity to integrate, incorporate and include specific community oriented psychosocial support services in uh, that are cultural context and that the interventions that are small enough and also big enough to cause a change. And these specifically should be developed within the setting, not borrowed from somewhere else, but tested out in that setting and evaluated and then the data given to show how it has been applied and what other communities or other settings can learn from that. And also it presents us an opportunity to increase or to think about making a priority of mental health intervention in our fundings. It presents an opportunity for including national policies, international policies that are directed to addressing or specifically attending to young people or adolescents when it comes to their health outcomes, including the, the mental health outcome. So I see it as an opportunity, as a learning platform for us to make better to plan ahead, to see that the next generation will not go through the same crisis if such a situation happens again, that they are better equipped and uh, they have uh, all the skills and the resilience to address their general uh, health being. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, Jackie, what's your commitments and what will you want to contribute to? Um, sure. Why don't you say that? Those are all really excellent points. Thank you. Um, and inspiring ones as well. You know, I would say um, several years ago, I was realizing that, you know, I could only see so many patients at a time. And really, if I wanted to have more of an impact, I had to take a step back and see if there are ways where there could be um, more ways to reach larger community at hand. So then started investing more of my time and disseminating evidence-based information and making it free. So things, if you just like click on a website, the articles are there, books in you know, book library. Um, but then, you know, the work that we're doing in our program right now, we have a social justice task force and trying to make our not only address our own biases and make the, our treatment more culturally responsive, but also to increase um, access to care to our diverse populations and realizing that there are so many barriers there to have, for us to be able to do that. And we took me hitting hitting walls, hitting ceilings, realizing that I need to take another step back and there's more work that I need to do. So recently I started getting involved um, in more like the federal government level. And so we just participated um, with the House of Commerce and Energy and sort of did for a mental health hearing. And I want to sort of increase um, the involvement there. So if there can be some policy level changes and to take the clinical psychology world and integrate it with the, not to be a politician, but to help inform the politicians so that they can make change at the policy level. And then that might trickle down and hopefully create more opportunities for us on the grounds to increase access as well. Fantastic. Um, I, I'm making a reflection. I want to sort of make a segue over to you, David. But I think one, one of the things that I've been really impressed by also picking up on the beautiful things you're contributing, because what you're often seeing in sort of macro policy processes and, and so on, it's 
that people do not have the skills that you would have as, as clinical psychologists. So how do we find a way of repackaging that so it becomes helpful uh, is critical. I think it's really, really important. Uh, and finding ways to have a way to develop the vocabulary around this, because it might not be coming back to mental health. We actually, this event was called Pathways to Lifelong Mental Wellbeing. I'm, I'm quite sure that well-being actually has an intention there. Because when you say health, people tend to reflect back on the clinical service uh, and ill health. So what's the other ways of making other sectors feel that this is a truly integrated perspective that also helps them achieve their outcomes? Uh, I think to me, I've been really inspired by some of the work I've seen quite recently coming out from Innocenti, David, where you try to build a shared sort of um, descriptive framework around skills that, uh, or maybe capabilities of what you call them, the kids might have, that would be helpful both for educationalists, for social workers, for communities, and really for the whole community has to rise, raise the child psychologically. Can you say a few things about those? Absolutely, Freddie. Thanks very much. I think some of our work on what makes me and, you know, the coping skills that kids will need in the 21st century, I think is critical. I think putting children at the center of their own mental health, including in conversations like today, yeah, um, what we found in UNICEF is that when we spoke to young people, not children, because it's hard to speak to children about their mental health while they're going through it. But if you speak to young adults in their 20s, they really say, I need to be part of this conversation. And I needed to be part of the conversation when I was an adolescent growing up, you know. Um, so I think that's fundamental, is bringing young people into these discussions to get a first-hand perspective and to also just basically widen the ownership of this. But the second thing, I think, is to really identify those skills and the various stakeholders who need to be applying them. The ones that we who tend to work more on the academic side and more on the clinician side tend to somehow not include in our conversations the teachers, the parents, and as I said before, the children themselves. Those are the frontline workers. And in many in many places, there's just simply are not enough skilled health professionals in most low and middle income countries to even deal with many of the traditional physical health, much less to be burdened with more. So it really will have to be some of those frontline workers who have to be retrained. I think those two are critical. And then a final one for me is what I think this summit and all of the work of the people around here are trying to do, which is to measure and understand. The more we know, the better we can advocate to policymakers, the better that will inform our work with practitioners, the better we'll be able to get civil society involved. We still know far too little about youth mental health, even though this is deep into the 21st century, and particularly outside of the high-income countries. Our knowledge from our particular evidence since this is very very weak indeed. So how can we build that? And how can we bring the community together of practitioners to get those from the middle income countries who generally don't often get an ear in in some of these more, you know, global forums, which tend to focus on research from the high income countries. And what you help me with now, I think one of the crucial things we have to do is to be helped and let us be helped by our friends. And my friend David just helped me to summarize this wonderful hour. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Uppsala Health Summit. And thanks for uh, you all panelists. It's been a wonderful hour, always too short, but this is the start of a journey together. And if we do some of the things that you have just advised us to do, we'll be really on a good pathway to lifelong mental well-being. Thank you all. Goodbye. Thank you so much for having me. I saw there was interest in connecting, so I'll just leave my email for anyone Please who wants do. to connect, Please and it's do. been such a pleasure. Thank you. I'll do the same. Thank you, Frederick. Thanks to all of the panelists. Wonderful Thank chat. You. Thanks a lot. Thank you, too.